professional musicians delivering long-term music programs um, in pediatric hospitals. And I'm really looking forward to hearing their perspective on the role that a professional musician can have in a pediatric hospital environment, um, delivering music sessions with children, including those with learning disabilities. I'm also happy just to say that both of them are Live Music Now alumna and continue their association with Live Music Now by um, delivering some of our training and mentoring for our current musicians. So over to you. Thank you very much. So hello everybody. We're just going to introduce ourselves first. So, I'm Rose and I work at the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital where I'm involved in three programmes of work there. One is uh, training music students on a music health module. Another is training medical students in music and communication. And the third is working alongside my partner musician on a program called Songbirds, which I'll talk to you about later on in the presentation. I'm Georgina. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to speak to you a little bit about my work uh, with children in health settings. I am primi primarily a professional cellist. I trained at the Global School of Music. And I've worked uh, as an orchestral player for many years, but I've always had an interest and a real passion for bringing music away from the concert halls and to vulnerable people. My first experiences in doing so were now 20 years ago through Live Music Now. I was a member of the scheme for six years, and that truly opened up my horizons and inspired me to develop a career in music and health. Since then, I've worked extensively in a variety of health settings as a music and health practitioner, predominantly for Mercy Care in mental health units and at all the Hayes Children's Hospital. Why musicians in hospital? Despite the current times with so many cuts affecting our health system, it seems like the authorities, the NHS and the arts organisations, like the Arts Council, recognise the importance of having music interventions in health settings by expanding their creative programmes. I have found a quote, and I really like this quote, which says, the hospital is a gathering of solitude. I think for us musicians, the main aim is to create a nice milieu, a milieu in which we can create meaningful connections with families and staff around the child's recovery and care and around the child's creativity. The sensory and auditory stimulation provided by music can offer something really different and sometimes unexpected, which hopefully can help contribute to a positive health experience for the child. The shared therapeutic enjoyment that comes out of the musical interactions may be due to the flexible, intuitive and improvised approach that we use in our methods of working as musicians. This approach may slightly differ from music therapists who very often work with a specific therapeutic goal given beforehand with individual patients and over a certain period of time and the intimacy we develop with patients and family can become quite emotional and holistic, always treating the child as a whole, body, mind and soul, rather than just as a patient or as a diagnosis. Okay, so some, some background and context to our practice. As Georgina mentioned, um, talking about music therapy, um, Costanza Preti has written specifically about our work alongside Professor Welch, I think, uh, initially. Um, and she is really the person who has mapped out our practice as musicians working in hospital. Um, many of the programmes in the UK today that take an approach that Georgina, Georgina and I use um, stem from the work of Music Asante, the French organisation, which has been working for some 25 to 30 years in hospital settings, looking at bringing musicians and music into the hospital setting. So we're thinking really about the perspective of the hospital specifically from the viewpoint of a disabled child. And as you can see, uh, the list there probably applies to any child who finds himself in hospital in an unknown environment. Uh, they could be isolated uh, medically and emotionally from other people. 
um, a lack of auditory variation, a lack of sensory stimulus, reduced opportunities for communication and interaction with others, with their peers and with their family, and therefore a reduced opportunity for self-expression. Now, as I said, for any child, that has an impact, but for a child who has a disability or a sensory impairment, that's impacted on greatly. And I'd just like to play you a little clip <coughs> of um, a typical ward environment soundscape. my residency at uh, Old Hayes Children's Hospital in Liverpool. Um, I have worked there for the past 10 years. Old Hay offers a varied program of enjoyable arts activities which include dance, music, comedy, arts, storytelling, creative writing, digital arts, animation and puppet making and it's always a great feeling to be to feel part of a team. Music intervention, in, interventions are carried out in a variety of settings and I'd like to give a small example for all uh, those varieties of settings I'm constantly <coughs> exposed to. In neuro post-operation area, I would for example assist a consultant to assess if a child can hear by lying my cello alongside their body on the bed playing low notes for more vibrations and singing. In cardiac surgery, <coughs> I was prompted by the play specialist to encourage a child to blow in various types of whistles to help him regulate his breathing in a fun and therapeutic way. Uh, areas like a &E and X-ray can be very challenging as families <coughs> and children are often in a state of panic and emergency. You have to deal spontaneously with a variety of levels of pain and anxiety. And you can sometimes feel in the way, but music has proven to be useful in those areas as a mean of distraction and passing time, as well as providing a less stressful environment. In the treatment room, I was asked by a specialist nurse to assist the withdrawal of the catheter with a teenage boy. We use the guitar to hide the sensitive area and a drum for extra pain relief with this motto, when hit by the pain, hit it back. <laughs> In the physiotherapy room, I would accompany painful steps or movements by exploring various sounds on my cello, like glissandos for stretches, tremolos for managing to stand up, pompous calls for managing steps. In sensory rooms, I would simply play in the background soft relaxing music, tuning in with the lights and other stimulus. The next slide is just a few pictures uh, to illustrate different scenarios. Nina, um, Nina on that corner, is a long-term patient with learning disabilities and autism, who I always see on a one-to-one. -one. I have with her specific therapeutic goals guided by mom and staff. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to go through these cases. This is just to show you the variety. Jada, on this corner, is waiting to be seen in a &E. We are passing time, and her anxiety seems to be relieved by focusing on learning to the guitar. She also provides entertainment for other patients and staff. Ben is a new patient on neurosurgery ward. He's awaiting diagnosis, which always represents very worrying times for the child and family. Dad says, Dad, who's playing the guitar, says this is the first time he's been he's seen uh, Ben smile in ages, and he always says, I've had such a good morning myself. You can note the special eye contact between father and son 
as they're both enjoying a short time away from pain and anxiety. Angelina is in the teacher's room on oncology. She has special needs and autism as well. This was a special moment where she let her mom and another patient join in a session. We performed for them and with them a song we had made up that afternoon. Utility, impact, and effect. This is a big question that I'll try to summarize as quick as possible. Even though, as musicians, we can't really measure the effect of our interventions, and we also have very little background about our, our patients, we can say that we seemingly contribute to positive health experiences in a child's life rather than treating an illness. We can do so by creating a positive environment and different sound worlds on the wall, by providing a moment of distraction, creating meaningful connections with staff and family, accompanying painful procedures with sound, providing <coughs> skills sometimes well preserved by illness, giving children a sense of ownership by being creative and focusing on the well-being rather than the sick being. As Ewan's mom, mom wrote on the, on the neurosurgery board, Ian was lucky enough to have a cello player before his visit to theatre yesterday. It was really relaxing and soothing for him and his parents under the circumstances. These art forms need to continue as they are so good for the children's welfare. <laughs> Music is the quickening art. This is a quote by Oliver Ask, which I'd like to illustrate with this short clip. Um, treatment and other activities. I will start playing the video as the first minute of it is silent, and I will explain as it plays about this short film. Treatment and other activities offered in the hospital may not have the capacity to offer that instant connection that music can provide spontaneously. This is a short <laughs> two minutes film that was made by a patient after a morning spent on the ward. I met most of the children on the day and it was one of those improvised moments. The first minute of it has no sound and shows each participant and the instruments they played. are assessed for unusual illness where I often have to deal with age difference and a, vari a variety of levels of sickness. The session took place in the play area of the ward, clearly brought children and families together, staff laughing, doctors stopping by, the mood on the ward was uplifted. There was a sense of fun, of joy, of relief in an environment which is by nature very sensitive and heavy hearted. From this, I remember with a smile the time Georgia, that uh, girl with the white top, the time that she took to create the introduction of her film and the fact that she has passed it on to me as she was so proud to have achieved making a song in such a short time. She wrote the lyrics of herself as call and response for the younger, <coughs> younger ones to join in. I bumped into her a few months later in the atrium of the hospital and she was so happy to show me that she still had the film on her iPad. I suppose we can call this a shared happy memory which leaves something behind. Something maybe greater than what I could have possibly imagined on the day. 
And I will move on now to another story, uh, completely different, uh, with a, a patient, uh, Ivan. Um, Ivan, uh, as I said, as musicians, we get very little background about our patients. All I knew about Ivan is that he has been in hospital from birth with complex needs and learning disabilities. I had the privilege to see him on a regular basis for about six months where he was transferred to a hospital in Birmingham. This is a three minute of half hour film session uh, filmed by a play specialist. And when I first met Ivan, his voice couldn't be heard and he had very limited movements. great deal of imagination. And he's, as you can see, he's being completely distracted by the medical procedure. He doesn't even acknowledge that the nurse is doing a procedure. Completely ignoring the beeping sounds. child and trying to keep it harmonious. Maybe that's a bit too directed for me. I'm going into my pentatonic scale. <laughs> so I can always keep, him, keep it harmonious, let's say. But he knows what he wants. lot with him uh, using silly sounds to help him with his voice because when I first met him his voice was very I think on this program. Um, Songbird is a, a program that actually is based around one ward in the hospital but we found that we've met children in our journey working that, uh, in other places in the hospital which um, who also fit our Songbird's remit which was initially to work with children from 0 to 5 years um, who are experiencing rehabilitation and uh, long-term hospitalisation so really those children that are often in hospital for many, many years, maybe from birth, maybe staying for two to three years, or come back again because of their conditions. And specifically on Ward 83, we work with children on, who are long-term ventilated, um, who have acquired brain injury. 
So I work with a, another musician um, in our project, um, and again, there's a side to our project which is about bringing two musicians together to develop their practice too. So um, Mark is a composer, and I'm quite interested in interaction and working with children who are really non-verbal. Most of my career has, has developed into that, that kind of field of working with children who um, don't use their voices to speak and tell me things, but um, we work in, in music to put music together. So we had a, a, a toolkit, if you like, of ideas that we worked with. One of them was to compose music specifically for the ward and for the children we worked with. So this kind of creative element. We were being, trying to work in response to what we learned from working with the children in the ward. And we also used some children's songs, familiar children's songs. Um, but we based our, our work around the idea of being very child-centered and used techniques of, of a child-centered approach. I'm going to play a little bit of a, a recording now from some, some music from a, a child we met. He's at one of our case studies. This young man we first met on a, a different ward to Ward 83. Um, Mum and Dad had heard us playing on the ward one day. And Mum called us in and asked us to go into the room. And Mark and I went in, we had some students with us at the time, um, and we began to play. Mum and Dad were in the room with the child. And the child started to cry um, when the music began to play. And for us that was a little bit upsetting. We didn't want to obviously cause him any harm or distress. Um, so we asked Mum, is it okay, shall we carry on? Mum said, yes, please carry on. So we did, um, and then we found out later on in our, our journey with this young man that he'd, um, he'd had a, a traffic accident and he used to play the cornet in a brass band. And the first time that we met him, he was finding it really hard to, to speak or say anything, but the emotion obviously got to him. Mum had asked him during the interaction if everything was okay, and he actually said, it's beautiful. Um, and when we'd stopped playing at the very end, she'd asked him if he wanted us to carry on playing. And he said, no, it's very well played. And he managed to say these words in amongst all this kind of upset that was going on. But all the time, Mum and Dad were very calm, and obviously we trying to support him and had been briefed by the medical staff as to what might be happening in this young man's, situ young man's situation. Later on, several weeks later, we met him on Ward 83, um, and the play specialist had found a keyboard for him to play. Um, and he'd recognised us in the doorway and said, oh, I remember you. And he actually apologised to us for what he'd said to us, which I found quite amazing that he'd done that. Um, this recording is a bit of music from that, that visit that day, where he said it was OK to record some music with him. Mum joined in, and you'll hear um, him playing the recorder, and you'll hear that he's finding his way to find the notes that fit with the tune. Specialist. And as I said before, um, the play staff are very key to our work. John had found the keyboard for the child before to explore and then a record of him to join in in our improvisation. So um, this relationship with staff that we work with is, is crucial, I think, um, in making our work as effective as it can be. So Haraya is a, a little girl who's one of our long-term ventilated patients. Um, and Mark and I, when we were working with these young children, we had to really learn to watch and um, be responsive to their communication. Um, some of these signals were very, very tiny. For some of the children who were very poor, it might just be the opening of an eye, the turning of a head, maybe not even turning a head totally, but a slight focus towards the direction of the sound. Music making might have just been the tapping of a finger on an egg shaker, or the slight movement of a foot. And we had to really train ourselves to look very, very closely at what was going on when we worked with these children. Um, we noticed over time that they became, we call them independent musical communicators, because all these uh, little indicators here, we found that they grew over time with many of the children. And um, we also found within an interaction as well, they grew as the children gained confidence, but they could also happen over long periods of time. But crucially, we reported back to youth music, um, that one thing we noticed too was that in a, in a child's uh, pathway of getting better and recovery, it's not linear as we know, so a child would get better and then maybe regress if something went wrong, they might go back into isolation, and we would see their worlds just completely go back several steps. But in the music making, we noticed that all these little kind of indicators were still there, but in a, in a smaller form. So 
um, that showed to us that the music making had a real kind of help to them in these journeys of going forward and backwards within their recovery. So this little bit of video is a uh, Haraya, and she's putting us through our paces in the early stages of our project. Um, and we also looked at um, facial expression, and we also worked with what we called mouth sounds, where the children might click their tongues or um, move their tongues or, or blow kisses sometimes to the staff. The staff often worked on blowing kisses. So this is me and Mark in the background playing, getting to know Haraya's communication. <laughs> Another case study that we have picked up by Youth Music was a Lydia, a young five and a half year old um, who we worked with. Um, her mum uh, gave us a quote in a case study that was put up on the Youth Music website. Um, and she talked about the importance of family and the family involvement of working uh, with music with her child in hospital. As you can imagine, when your child is so poorly, um, you know, your whole family life goes, goes completely out of the window. So music can have an important role in bringing everybody back together. But crucially for Lydia, one of the stories that came out in our project was that um, Mum had noticed how much Lydia responded to the music, and again, they were quite uh, small, I suppose, indicators, smiles and head turning, uh, reaching out to touch instruments. But on one particular day, she didn't respond, and Mum was very concerned, and she kept going back to the nursing staff and saying, I'm sure something's not right. Um, we later found out that day that um, Lydia had gone down to surgery in the afternoon because something was wrong with her shunt. So in our reporting back, um, we obviously realised that not only the benefits of the child and their interaction with music important, but when the child doesn't respond, it can help medical staff know that something is not quite right when they're in contact with the parents and rely on their you know, intense knowledge of their child. <coughs> One last look at the video is another little girl, um, Imi from Wood 83. Um, and I just want to show you a clip just to really show about the voice of vocalisation. John had told us that um, Imogen, she really struggled to be sat up in a chair. She was very, very uncomfortable. Um, and this clip, you'll see that she's in her, her bed. Mum's actually watching. And again, another story that came up from our project was that uh, for children who've had an acquired brain injury, again, the world is turned upside down for the family. And um, on one particular day, um, Imi had been listening to some music with us um, and she'd been laughing and giggling and then she just started to cry. And Mum came up to us and said, I, I don't understand why my child is crying. And in our notes we wrote about this as, um, you know, we really felt that Mum was really struggling to come to terms with the situation that her, her and her child were in. How do I know my child now when I don't really recognise the person in front of me? So this video um, is a little bit later on. We played a tune um, that we, we thought um, Imogen really enjoyed. And Mum watched this video, she was there when um, she watched the, the actual music ha happening, um, and you'll see that um, Imogen starts to vocalise. Um, Mum had never seen any respond to the music um, to this, this point, and afterwards she said, she's singing, she's singing. So for her, we felt that helped her reconnect with her child, and she could see that her child was there. And she did later like tell us that my daughter really used to enjoy music, you know. Well, we think that she still, still does.
uh, just a few thoughts that children with learning disabilities may be so overwhelmed, confused and distressed by their feelings when they are in hospital that they may not be able to express those feelings. Music is much more than just a non-verbal or pre-verbal communication. It creates companionship and meaningful connections between people. Children who are ill and still are still children first and foremost. And it is important to retain a focus on helping them to express this normal and healthy aspect of their identity, rather than just being defined by their illness. Victor Hugo, the French writer, clearly acknowledged the importance of role of music in communication when he said, music expresses that which cannot be said and on which it is impossible to be silent. Thank you very much.